In this video, we do a kinetic analysis of reactions that take place at the equilibrium. All right, so uh, imagine that you have a pretty simple reaction, A to give B, that has a rate constant uh, K. Uh, and until now, what we actually have studied is that uh, the reaction would just proceed from A to B, uh, and it would not be reversible. Uh, but we know that in most chemical reactions, uh, the reversible pathway, so B to give A, uh, occurs to some extent, however great. Okay, so let's assume that in this case, uh, the, rever the reversible reaction uh, is, is pretty prevalent. K okay, and occurs through a rate constant, uh, K prime. Okay, one of the things that we could do is then map how the concentrations of, uh, concentrations of A and B change as a function of time. Okay, so uh, we could do the following. Here we have the concentration of either A or B as a function of time. And then let's assume that we start with uh, no B and only reagent A. Okay, so uh, this will be our concentration of A initially. And let's suppose that uh, the decay is something like this. That's how A decays. And then for B, what should happen is exactly the opposite. Okay, initially there's no B. And then after some time has elapsed, B grows in that manner. Okay, so if we actually draw this correctly, what you should observe is that after some time, okay, uh, the concentrations of reagents and products do not change on time anymore. Okay, so uh, like right after this point, you can see the concentration of A doesn't change in time, the concentration of A doesn't change on time, and uh, that's when we say that the reaction has reached equilibrium. Okay, so the question is, well, can we do a kinetic analysis for those processes? All right, so these are going to be now elementary steps, right? So there's no intermediate steps in uh, A going to B is a process that takes place directly. And what that means is that the rate for the forward process, okay, so the rate uh, of A to go to B can be written as K times the concentration of A it will be a unimolecular process. Okay, and at the same time, the rate uh, of B to give A, the reverse reaction, would you just be simply K prime times the concentration of the reagent of that reaction, which is uh, B, okay? Uh, this is what we have. So at any point uh, in the reaction, at the start of the reaction or at the end of the reaction, uh, we could actually define the rate of product formation, okay? And then uh, the rate of uh, product formation is simply going to be uh, the rate of the reactions that are forming the product minus the rate of the reaction that are uh, the reactions that are actually removing product from the reaction mixture. Okay, so we can say that the rate of product formation, which is which is just how the concentration of B changes in time, this is again simply the uh, rate of the reaction that is producing B minus the rate of the reaction that is uh, removing B uh, from solution. Look up. All right, now. Uh, this applies to any point in this diagram, but uh, after you have reached equilibrium, which is uh, from this time on, okay, from the dashed line on, you have equilibrium, the concentrations that don't change anymore, then what actually happens is that, well, uh, the concentration of B doesn't change on time, right? So at equilibrium, we have that uh, this is equal to zero. Okay, there's no change in the concentration of B on time. It's just, it's just a constant concentration. Okay, so uh, what that would mean is that uh, we would be here, and this is equal to zero. Or in other words, we have that K times the concentration of A at equilibrium should be equal to K prime concentration of B at equilibrium. Okay, so this is interesting. In terms of that, that you reach equilibrium when the rate of the reaction that is generating a uh, product is identical to the rate of the reaction that is removing product. Okay, so uh, that is when you actually uh, get to equilibrium. From a macroscopic perspective, it looks like, well, the concentration of B is not changing because the reaction stops. But we actually understand that that is not the case at the microscopic level. The microscopic level is that well, the reaction is still taking place, but the rates of the reaction that are forming B uh, is identical to the rate of the reaction that is removing B. Okay, so uh, uh, that means that microscopically, microscopically, the concentration of B does not change at all. all right, so something interesting happens when if you actually uh, are able to uh, uh, group together uh, the rate constants and the concentrations. Okay, so 
where we actually uh, group together the concentrations. Uh, that will be the concentration of B at equilibrium over the concentration of A at equilibrium. This is equal to K over K prime. Okay, But we also know from thermodynamics that if these were divided by the reference concentrations, okay, that is actually the same thing as the equilibrium constant for the reaction, which is capital K. Okay, So this tells you there's a beautiful correlation or connection between uh, a thermodynamic parameter, which is the equilibrium constant, and the kinetic uh, parameters of the reaction, which are the rate constants of the forward and the reverse process. Okay, so it's again a, a very beautiful connection between uh, something that we've seen a long time ago, thermodynamics, and uh, what we're introducing now, which is kinetics. Okay, and that is what happens for reactions at equilibrium. Okay, the equilibrium constant is just the ratio of the rate constant uh, for the forward reaction over uh, the rate constant of the reverse reaction. This is universal. It applies to every single reaction at equilibrium. Now, uh, to reinforce our, uh, uh, this notion that these two things are related, one of the things that we can do is to see how all of this is affected by temperature. Okay, So we learned in thermodynamics that the green constant uh, uh, changes with temperature according to the Lenz-Hartelier principle. And then we actually also know that these rate constants change with temperature according to the Arrhenius expression. Okay, so let's see if we can actually see if we can uh, uh, see how those things uh, come together. All right, so uh, to see the Le to revisit the Le Chatelier principle, we can draw here the energy diagram for this uh, reaction. Okay, and let's assume that the reaction is exothermic. Okay, that would mean that uh, this is the energy diagram for uh, A going to B. Okay, it's exothermic, that means that you liberate energy as you go from A to B. All right, so we're going to try to see what should happen to the equilibrium constant if we were to increase the temperature in this exothermic reaction. All right, so uh, again, if we increase the temperature, what should happen to the equilibrium constant, which is uh, capital K, big K? Okay, should it go down or should it, should it go up? Well, what we actually see is that uh, the equilibrium might change to minimize the effect of the disturbance uh, that is introduced when you elevate the temperature. Right, so notice that if the equilibrium is displaced from A to B, you are actually putting more energy in the reaction medium because the reaction is exothermic. Okay? That would not minimize the disturbance of the elevation in temperature. It would actually add more energy to the reaction medium. Instead, a way to minimize the, the effect of the raise in temperature uh, in the equilibrium would be for the reaction to actually go into the reverse direction. Okay? Because the reverse direction would be endothermic, okay? and that would absorb some of the energy that has been put in play by elevating the temperature. Okay, so what we actually see is that uh, if we uh, rewrite here the equilibrium constant, concentration of B at equilibrium over the concentration of A at equilibrium, if the reaction is displaced in the reverse reaction with an increase in temperature, then this concentration is going to go down, and that concentration is going to go up. And what that means is that the equilibrium constant actually should decrease with an increase in temperature. Okay, that is the prediction from Le Chatelier's principle. Right, so let's see if this is actually borne out by the kinetics predictions. Okay? We have these two things also depend on temperature. Okay, and the way that they depend on temperature uh, is to the Green's expression. Okay, we can uh, do the following. Natural log of K is equal to the natural log uh, of the pre-exponential factor minus the activation energy over RT. Okay, so the way to uh, think about this is as follows. Look, this is the activation energy for the forward reaction, E sub A. And this would be the activation energy for the reverse reaction, which is E sub A prime. So clearly, for this exothermic reaction, the activation energy for the reverse reaction is greater than the activation energy for uh, the forward reaction. Okay, what we have learned uh, from the Reynolds expression is that the larger the activation energy is, the greater is the increase in the rate constant with temperature. Okay, so we're going to elevate the temperature now and see what happens to the rate constants. Okay, because the activation energy of the reverse reaction is greater, uh, the change to K prime with temperature, the increase in K prime with temperature will also be greater than it is for K. Okay, so both of these things will grow with temperature, but this one will, uh, will uh, grow proportionally more 
okay, because the activation energy Ea prime is greater than here. Okay, so what will happen then is that again, with temperature, these will grow more than that, and that means that uh, uh, the green constant should go down, okay, which is exactly what we had predicted with thermo thermodynamics. So we see that this uh, relationship holds even uh, when we actually try to change the temperature. Okay, everything seems to be falling into place, which lends some confidence to the work that we have done in this video.